You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Thanks so much for joining me here today on this Total Wellness Tuesday, where we're back with another Ayurvedic-based show. Really excited that each and every week since episode 900, we've been able to bring you one Ayurveda-based themed show each week, teaching you all the different aspects of Ayurveda little by little to allow you to better digest and absorb a little bit of information from the oldest form of medicine in the world, literally a 6,000-year-old form of medicine medicine that's truly comprehensive, which every form of medicine came from. Really interesting to me to look back, reading the text to this day and understanding that whether it be Chinese medicine, whether it be a lot of the Greek forms of medicine, or what was even passed down to what we have as conventional-based medicine. All of it takes its roots, its true roots, in rebalancing the body. Now, in conventional medicine, we do it in much more of a harsh way, right? You're trying to use pharmaceuticals to shut down certain parts of the body that might be overactive. But what you're trying to do, though, is find balance within the body. Is that the most efficient and effective way? Absolutely not, especially in the long term. If we would just go back and we would look at all of these Eastern-based forms of medicine, we would understand that health, that weight loss, that true anti-aging is about balance in the body. It's about balancing what's called the homeostatic systems of the body, creating equilibrium, or as the natural hygienist used to say, dynamic equilibrium in the body, so that the body, although always in motion, works like a teeter-totter or a seesaw in order to keep itself balanced. So if one side starts to get too heavy, it pushes back down in the other. Now, of course, in time and over time, if neglected, what happens is one side, one lever pushes down too hard. And that's when disease manifests. That's when we actually get to see it, right? Because the rain barrel has overflowed. Only at that time, although it might have been going on for weeks, months, most likely years, finally manifested. Now, in conventional medicine, they give you a drug to either push that lever back up or push the other lever down really hard to balance it out. Well, here's the problem. Only, only in time will you see the actual pharmaceuticals then cause the next ailment in the body. Because unless you fix and rebalance the underlying root causes that created that dysfunction or imbalance in the first place, you can never hope to get well. Not only that, more things will continue to mount, right? Because you never really emptied that rain barrel in the first place. Instead, you just continued to add more to it. So you have different types of symptoms, which is why we see people who are on blood pressure medication or diabetes-based medication end up with heart disease, right? Or they end up with Alzheimer's, or they get some type of Barrett's esophageal-based cancer if they're always on you know, Prilosec all the time or something like that. So you have to understand is that if you have the acid reflux, find out why you have the acid reflux. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, ask yourself why you have rheumatoid arthritis. Same with Hashimoto's, right? Is there a deficiency? Is there a toxicity? Is there both? If so, is it mercury? Is it cadmium? Is it a lack of selenium? What is it? You know, figure out what that is, either through functional medicine lab testing or some type of protocol in order to begin to rebalance the body. And that's what Ayurveda teaches us. And again, with our new bioregulatory medicine and our new forms of naturopathic medicine and, you know, more natural forms of functional medicine, because functional medicine, you know, can really go both ways. It depends on the practitioner. A lot of doctors prescribe a lot of hormones and, and they're calling that functional medicine. I can't get behind that, right? Essentially not initially, at least. If you're giving hormones, you're not asking why are the hormones imbalanced in the first place. 
So unless you've begun to work on rebalancing those hormones, giving someone estrogen, giving them testosterone is not going to be the best idea, especially initially, right? Because what we're doing then is we're pushing again harder on one of the levers, giving the body hormone that it might purposely be lowering for some specific reason, which is why I just really ask people to get to the bottom and ask why. If you have low testosterone, why do you have low testosterone? Let's just ask the question why. You say, oh, well, you know, I'm 50 years old. Testosterone starts to get lower. No, it does not. No, no, not at 50 years old, okay? You're not 75, 80 years old. You're 50. You're not supposed to have low testosterone yet. That's not how it works, okay? So what we're looking to do is ask why the low testosterone. Same with women with low progesterone. Why the low progesterone, which is leading to your estrogen dominance? Why, why, why we ask, right? So we say, okay, well, it could be higher levels of sympathetic nervous system stress, leading to an exacerbation, a greater production of what's called catecholamines, your norepinephrine, your adrenaline, and leading to more cortisol output, right? The cortisol output, which is more of the glucocorticoids, leading to then a further movement away from progesterone and towards cortisol, more towards that stress-based state. So when we begin to look, again, Ayurveda did not say it in that exact way. They didn't have the exact terminology, but they spoke about that, right? If they would say, oh, well, a person is, we would call it a sympathetic nervous system-based state, a sympathetic dominant-based state. And that just means fight or flight or stress. Well, they saw that. They called it a high vata Based states, high vata mindset or vata in body. And then what they would do is they would what? Pacify vata, calm vata. And what would that do? Well, it would get them to more of a balanced, relaxed state. What would that do then? Well, it would then allow the person to either boost back up testosterone or progesterone or both or whatever they needed. So you have to understand is just because the language was different in Ayurveda doesn't make it any less useful today. If anything, it's more useful. And that's because we've gotten out of right living as the natural hygienist called it. They called it right living. Something that I teach a lot in the, uh, to the integrative health practitioners is you know, it's about right living. It's about doing the right things in life that we always used to do in order to keep our bodies well. And we just have a harder time today because we live in a world of plastic, of toxins, of EMFs, of all of these things. And they're putting put into kids at a young age. They're being in adult bodies. And, you know, it's our job to keep removing them, like just to keep up, right? So really, really important we look into that. Well, today along the same topic, I want to talk about the five, and there are five basic types of nutritional disorders going on right now with, I would say, 90% of people in our culture. And the reason is that we have a lot of different foods that we never used to be able to eat. And I want to go through a lot of those right now, not just food-based, but what's happening with also food combination. I've done podcasts on this before. So if you want to see those shows or listen to those shows, simply go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts and type in food combining. All right, just in quotations and you'll be able to see that. Well, what I'd like to do right now, because there are five, is go through the first one. So the first nutritional-based disorder is something called quantitative dietary deficiency. Now, what does that mean? Quantitative dietary deficiency. Well, it just means a total, when we look at the total, quantitative, lack of food or nutrition. So if someone in the world is not getting enough nutrition, what happens? Well, they get something called malnutrition. And that means that not only are they not getting enough calories, they might start to lose a lot of weight, right? But it also means that they're going to have a lot of other things go wrong because they're not going to get enough of the micronutrients, not just the calories, the macros of the protein, carbs, and fat, but the micros of the vitamins like vitamins and vitamin C and collagen, all these great things. Well, what happens? Well, their skin begins to wrinkle at a faster age. They begin to break down a lot faster. They lose muscle tone. Joints have a tendency to hurt more often. They have brain fog. These are all quantitative based disorders. And you might say, well, that doesn't happen in places like the United States or UK or Canada or Europe or Australia or New Zealand. I'm just going to keep naming every country in the world. But that's actually not true. And that's because we have so many people, and mainly women, undernourishing their body. They're undernourishing their body because they're trying to fit some ideal that we've decided over here in the West to be the ideal body. 
And for a lot of women, that's not even achievable because they're not the vata body type. They're not the ectomorph. So to be that thin is literally causing them to be malnourished because they're eating less food than their body really deserves and should have. So can it happen in men? Absolutely. But I, I have a practice where we see thousands of people every single year, and I know that this is mainly a disturbance, as I call it, because I wish that it wasn't there. And I do have two daughters, and I never want to see this happen to them. But I know the pressures that society puts on women. But what happens is, so this isn't just developing countries where maybe I was doing a lot of my internships in India and seeing very malnourished children, and it was awful. And there was essentially nothing I could do on a grand scale. And I would, I can remember right now trying to do my best at least just to buy them food. But it was, it was obviously just a small gesture since that's all I was able to do. And I was only there for a limited time. But that's one case. But the other case is that a lot of people are actually taking in so few calories that they're undernourished. Okay. Qualitative dietary deficiency. This means that maybe you're getting the right amount of calories but a lot of the food is processed. So this becomes a really big issue because what happens is we're still malnourished. So the first person is malnourished because they don't take in enough food. The second person is malnourished because they're taking in too much processed food. And that processed food contains very little actual nutrition. Plenty of calories, but very little nutrition. Because nutrition is not the carbs, the proteins, and fats. That's part of it. Good nutrition contains the B vitamins, right? It contains the glutamine, the vitamin C, and the D, and the calcium, and the magnesium, sodium, potassium, selenium, chromium, phosphorus, copper, all of these things, right? Our body's made up of those things. And so without that, sure, you can be taking in a lot of food, but what happens is we end up now with diseases of the body because we have plenty of calories, which can lead to obesity. But if we're taking in all of that processed food, we can also have the diabetes, we can have high cholesterol, we can have all sorts of inflammatory-based issues. Okay, really important to look at that as well. That happens when we're taking in inflammatory process-based foods. Third part I'd like to add is this, and this is really, really an issue. Let's say the person's not taking enough calories. Let's say it's the person that is, you know, naturally, their natural body weight, they look great, great for their body type at 140 pounds, okay? But they're trying to get down to 120, right? Because they want to be just very, very thin, okay? So they get from 140, which is they're just a good weight. They're at a great weight for that, right? And they get down to 120. Well, they did that by eating probably less than their body needs. But if you do that at the same time, if you have a quantitative deficiency, and at the same time you add a qualitative deficiency, now you're setting yourself up for disaster. So if the person who's trying to lose a lot of weight and get really, really thin is doing it through eating a lot of vegetables, a lot and a lot of vegetables, which are not high calorie, a little bit of protein, a little bit of fat, and they lose weight, it's still a whole lot healthier than it is if they're losing weight by doing something where they're trying to count points and they're allowing themselves to eat popcorn and processed food, just but they're still staying hypocaloric. They're still staying below their calories in order to lose weight. That is dangerous. So now you're totally micronutrient deficient as well as macronutrient and you're taking in processed carbs at the same time. Those processed carbs over time, high triglycerides, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes. And again, you don't have to be overweight to get any of these things. Now you can, you can without a doubt, like, oh, you could actually start gaining weight because your body's shutting down. Your body is toxic, which leads me into this next one, the toxins in foods, okay? The fourth nutritional disorder is if you're eating a lot of foods that have a lot of pesticides or they're pumped full of hormones. So a lot of our fruits and vegetables, right? Fruit and vegetables, they contain a lot of pesticides. And some of those pesticides we know now cause cancer, right? We know that. They've been ruled in a state, in a court of law that they've been proven to cause cancer. Okay. So we're eating those on a daily basis. Those are certainly toxins. And even small amounts, they might say, oh, well, it doesn't cause cancer in small amounts. But sure, sure, understood. But what about over years of eating them? And what about, because we never talk about this, how those pesticides, which kill bugs or at least keep bugs away, they kill the bugs in our gut. They kill the healthy bacteria. What does that do over time? 
How does that imbalance our immunity? How does that imbalance our body's ability to naturally burn body fat through something called firmicutes and bacterioides, right? The balance between those. And I've spoken about that on a previous podcast. And what about though, I know a lot of people talk about this like, oh, well, you know, I, I eat a lot of meat or I eat a lot of protein. They say that. Well, you could be getting pesticides that way as well. What if, which is certainly happening, if you're buying conventional meat, they're feeding a lot of the grains and a lot of the foods that have pesticides on them to the animal, right? And then you're eating that animal. But not only what else are they doing that animal, well, they want to make that animal as large as possible. The larger the animal, every single animal, the more meat they can sell. So they fatten the animal up as much as possible. An easy way to do that is to give it foods that it was never meant to eat that are much greater in caloric density. So instead of, let's say, a cow eating grass, they feed it soy, corn, all sorts of different grain, and even candy. And this is clinically proven. I spoke about this as well. I shouldn't say clinically proven. This is proven just because this is obviously what happens. I wrote about this in the rain barrel effect. So not only do you feed it all of these grains, which of course make it sick, and in order for it not to be sick, then you give them antibiotics. That's why half of all antibiotics in the United States go to farm animals, which is pretty insane and not something that you ever really hear about. So now we have all these farm animals taking antibiotics, eating inflammatory foods for them, and they're diseased animals, and then we eat those animals. What do you think that it does to us in the long term? You don't just get to get off scot-free by just putting anything you want in your body and pretending it has no effect. If you drink one of those soft drinks or whatever you want to call them, energy drinks or even zero-calorie drinks that are bright yellow, bright orange, bright red, bright green, or bright blue, any of those colors, bright purple, pick another color, and they contain yellow five and all the different paints in them, Okay, because they're paints, they're actual dyes, and you drink that over time, what do you think that's going to do to your body by putting paint in it, right? And then you compound that with the pesticides, and you compound that with all the hormones, the growth hormone, the estrogen that they pump into the animals as well to make them as large as possible. Do you think that that may affect you? Do you think it could be one more reason we see girls going through puberty at such a young age? Because they're eating all of these animals that are pumped full of all this hormone. And that includes the milk, right? The milk comes from that animal I just spoke about. If that animal has been fed pesticides and grains and antibiotics and recumbent bovine growth hormone and estrogen, it's given all of those things. Don't you think that might come out in the milk? I would say so. It's been shown to come out in mother's milk, right? So if a mom's being exposed to plastics and pesticides and even higher levels of cortisol, it'll show up in her milk. So, of course, that's showing up whenever we've talked about that. No one talks about that, right? But, of course, that's showing up in your dairy milk that you get as well. So, all of these things over time create nutritional disorders. That's a toxicity. So, that's neither too little calories or a poor food choice, right? Too much maybe, right? Too much. But this right here is an overload of toxins. And this isn't something that you would have seen as much 5,000 years ago, right, in India. You wouldn't have seen that as much. However, there would be still plants, residues, or plant you know, items that, you, that would have been an issue for you. So, for example, 5,000 years ago, those people still susceptible to nightshades would not have been able to eat nightshades. They would have been able to eat the regular potatoes or eggplant or bell peppers or cayenne peppers, anything like that, right? They wouldn't have been able to eat those foods, tomatoes. So they would have to stay away from that because for them, that would have been a toxin. They'd have to deal with the estrogen, the hormones, all of those things. Absolutely not. And a lot of countries don't do that, which is great. In New Zealand, they don't allow cows to be pumped full of all those things. They're grass-fed. Different laws, different way, which is so much so much better, right? You don't get the animals as large, but they're much healthier animals. Now, what if people just ate less meat? right? What if you ate less? What if you didn't worry about having to cut it all out completely, but you just ate less? How much better would it be if you said, I'm only choosing grass-fed and grass-finished, and I'm only eating pastured-based poultry or pastured-based eggs? Obviously, not only would it be better for the environment, it'd be healthier for you and the animals as well. So that is a much better choice to take, and that's our number four. The fifth nutritional disorder is eating foods that are improper for your constitution. 
Now, again, we've been talking about this since episode 900. Each and every week on the Cabral Concept since episode 900, I've been giving you one more show about Ayurveda and the different body types, as well as the constitutions. So I've said that you have to understand where your body is at right now in life. That's called your Vrkriti, or we call it in modern day, our phenotype. Now, your genotype is how you're born, as well as your Prakriti in Ayurveda. That's, that's who you are. That's how you're born. But there can be a shift, and it's a shift away from your natural body type. Now, what can happen is this. We can become that person who went from 140 pounds naturally to 120 pounds. Now, we're no longer maybe in that great, healthy kapha-based body type or endomorph body type, but we're too much on the vata-based side. And now, we're eating too few of the foods to maintain a healthy weight. We can also look at it another way. If you're someone who's trying to lose weight because you actually are 30 pounds, 40 pounds away from your goal weight, and you're eating an excessive amount of processed food and flour and bread and a lot of dairy and a lot of meats and a lot of grains, you're eating a lot of anabolic-based foods. And those foods are great for increasing IGF-1 levels. They're also great for increasing blood sugar levels. And as we do that, and if it, that person is not sensitized to insulin, they're not going to be able to take up all of the starches that they eat. And even a lot of people don't know this, when you eat a big steak or a lot of protein, it actually raises blood sugar as well. You can look up the glycemic load of food and what that does to your body. Maybe I'll do a show on that in the future. There are so many ways to raise your blood sugar beyond carbohydrates. That's what a lot of people are missing out there, is that when we listen to the keto talk, when we listen to low carb talk, we forget about cortisol, we forget about stress, we forget about caffeine, and we forget about that Eating these large protein meals also spike blood sugar. Really important to keep in mind, okay? So as we're talking about how to live better, we need to also understand what's best for our body. The people who need to gain weight so that they stay healthier for their constitution need more starch. Now, you don't have to do grains if you don't want. You could do more sweet potatoes, more yams, more yuca, more of the root-based vegetables. Those will all be great. And if you're someone who needs to lose weight, well, you don't need as much of that energy-based food, especially late in the day. Everyone, though, can eat carbohydrates. It's okay. I've been teaching that quite a bit in the IHP uh, program, but also in the past, I would say, 200 episodes or so of the Cabral Concept because I'm always changing topics based on what the feedback is based on what I see out there. If I see people push too far in one direction, I try to be a voice of reason. I try to get people a little bit more back on track. Besides just weight and body transformation, we also want to look at this. If you're someone with psoriasis and skin-based issues, eczema, you're most likely either going to want to run a food sensitivity test, an organic acids test, a stool-based test, see if there's candida overgrowth, see if there's bacterial overgrowth, see if there's food sensitivities, or you're at least going to want to eliminate the dairy, the gluten, and probably eggs to start, right? Some of the main food allergens that I've spoken about in the past. You're going to want to make sure that you're not eating foods that are incompatible with your health right now. Okay. Same goes for rheumatoid arthritis or Hashimoto's. Again, you can test for a really great um, lab test called the thyroid adrenal hormone. And you can test for a lot of these thyroid-based issues. You can test for a lot of these cortisol-based issues. Really, really important to look at. Another one is this, is just eating foods that are not great for your season. Okay. So if you're someone that loves big salads, but you live in New England like I do, probably not the best food during January. Now, if you still want to eat salads because of all the great nutrition in them, you'll probably want to grate some ginger over it, or you'll want to add a little bit of heat, some horseradish or some pepper. You'll want to eat, add some heat to all of that cold because you're in a cold environment. People typically want more warming, nourishing foods. I do it myself. So I do a smoothie every morning, no matter what the day, no matter what the temperature. But I don't drink the cold smoothie during the winter. What I do is I'd allow it to sit for 20 minutes or so. I just give it a little shake, stir it back up, and then I start to sip on it then. I'll also throw in about a, a half a thumb or a thumb of ginger in there. It adds a lot of heat to it. it. Tastes delicious. So those are all things that you can do to begin to balance your season. 
balance your body type. Food combining is another one really, really important to look at. Is that just making sure you're not just throwing, you know, 20 different ingredients into one meal and asking your body to digest it, especially if you have a lot of bloating, a lot of gas, a lot of acid reflux. Make easier to digest meals for yourself. Try to just choose one or two vegetables, one root based vegetable, one protein. So don't do the surf and turf, right? Make it easier for your body to break these things down. That All of those things, not only will they allow for better and easier digestion, but you're going to be then be able to better extract the nutrition from that food, which is really what it's all about. So going right back to the very beginning, what we're talking about is balance. We're also talking about giving the body what it needs. If someone needs less calories to maintain weight, well, we need to figure out, is there a metabolic-based disorder? Does this person have a thyroid-based issue. We can run, again, that thyroid adrenal hormone test. We can run a complete thyroid. We can run hair tissue mineral analysis to see stress levels. We can run those labs, okay? But the other thing we want to look at is, okay, they might just not need as many calories. So we can adjust based on that. But what we can't short-circuit our body with is a lack of micronutrients. You need all of your vitamins on a daily basis. You need all of your minerals on a daily basis. Now, they don't have to come at a particular meal, but we need them over the course of a day. You know, there's a lot of talk about does every meal have to have every single one of the essential amino acids or amino acids in general. And a lot of the research shows that if you get over the course of a day, you're good. You're fine. Now, is it easy to get it at one meal? Yes. You just have to know the proper food combining, right? So we can look at that. But my goal for you is this. It's understanding that you need to meet your micronutrient requirements so that you're not at what's called a qualitative dietary deficiency. So what we do every day in my practice, just so I can share that with you, is something called the Dr. Ball Daily Protocol. We do a daily nutritional support shake. Some people decide to do the daily activated multivitamin instead, but you need all those vitamins and all those minerals. So it makes it easy. And then we do a whole food greens and reds blend called the daily fruit and vegetable blend. And that's 22 organic fruits and vegetables. And we do that so that we get the best of nature. We get 22 different types of fruits and vegetables. And then also we add in something called the daily probiotic support. Now what that does is it seeds the intestines. It seeds the gut with good bacteria so that you're better able to utilize all the food and nutrition that you put in it. So that's what we do every day to make sure that we're never at what's called a qualitative dietary deficiency because we solve it right there with breakfast, right? With the daily nutritional support, the daily fruit and vegetable blend, and the probiotic. But then we want to make sure that we're eating the right amount of calories as well for our body. We do that in a couple ways. One is we can obviously weigh ourselves, so that, that's one part of it. I've done shows on BMI. I've done shows on body composition. You can go back and you can tune into those. But another way to look at that is this, is that you're trying to eat the majority of your foods as you would see growing in nature. So when you look at your plate or before you blend them up, do you say, hey, does that, does that resemble, for the most part, something that I've seen in nature? Now, I don't have a problem with people doing some oats or some doing some ground things, whatever it might be, okay? But that, at one time, is basically, it's a single ingredient. That was coming from nature, right? So that's how I try to look at it, is the majority things that I could recognize in nature. So we're getting really good quality of food and then enough nourishment for our body? Do we feel satiated after a meal? Do we get enough of each macro, the carbs, the protein, and the fat? Or do we, have we just gone too low on, too, on carbs for too long or too low on protein or too low on fat, right? We're trying to keep them balanced. I was thinking about this the other day. I was actually it's just on a walk and I was thinking about it. And I just was thinking to myself, like all the crazy things I see out there right now with insane hard workouts and, you know, just completely keto for life instead of it just being part of a cycle or something like that. And I said, you know, there's never been a time in human history, never been a time in human history where you've pushed things so far in one direction and it's ever been right. It's never been right. It's never been right in politics. It's never been right in culture. It's never been right in community. It leads to the downfall on a grand scheme of things in overall you know, society. And when we're talking about nutrition, it leads to a downfall of the body. And I always go back to, they would never have talked, they've never, never have spoken about that in Ayurveda. What they talked about in Ayurveda is some people need a little bit more carbs. Some people need a little bit less. But we would never go so far as to just completely eliminate. So remember, the big t- takeaway is this is to understand that all you're trying to do in life in order to have the body that you want, the health you want, and to live longer, stronger, is to give your body everything that it needs 
to thrive. No more, no less. If you do that, you're going to be a happy, healthy human being. Thanks so much for tuning into today's Cabral Concept. Truly appreciate it. And as always, if this show is helpful, please do feel free to share it with anyone else you believe it could serve. Before you go, I wanted to ask you this question. What if I could teach you in just a couple of hours how to transform your thyroid, hormones, adrenal, cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar, weight loss, energy, mood, brain, pregnancy, anti-aging, or many other health-related issues? After 20 years in private practice, after seeing and overseeing a quarter of a million client appointments, I sincerely feel I have the real-world data and have found the answer you've been searching for. So what I've done is spent hundreds of hours of my own time refining what you need to know in order to uncover your underlying root cause health issues and then begin to rebalance the body and bring it back to a state of robust health and wellness. I'm going to teach you exactly what I do in my private practice so you can understand how you got here and now what you need to do in order to heal. You'll receive all of the important success checklists, protocols, and even ways to customize it to make the program fit your busy life. And you'll get all of this at a fraction of the price. Let me save you the time, money, energy, stress, and frustration of not knowing what to do next. Instead of reading dozens of books on the topic and seeing multiple practitioners, I will condense everything that you need to know in just a few hours of video tutorials that you can watch and listen to anywhere. Together, we will make this healing process an enjoyable one that you can take with you for the rest of your life. I wish you all of the best of health and happiness, and I hope to be able to guide you on your healing journey through my Health Results Accelerators. Simply choose the health imbalance you're currently suffering from, and by the end of today, you'll know what went wrong and how to get well again. I guarantee it. For details, head over now to stephencabral.com forward slash courses. Courses.